This is our second video about constructing proofs. Once again, we're only using the rule arrow out at this point, and so life will be relatively simple. The argument for which we're going to construct a proof is a little bit longer. In fact, at this point, since we've only got one rule, the only way to make things interesting is to make them longer. So here's our argument. In theory, these symbols correspond to the logical structure of some argument that you might express in English. But actually, if you look at what this one says, it's got these B's and E's and F's repeated. It would be quite a challenge to find an English argument which sounded anything but crazy that actually corresponded to this. But that's okay, because what we're interested in doing is really just playing with the symbols. Applying rules to symbols is what logic is all about. Okay, so first of all, we might just go through here and identify the premises. And you can see we've got one premise, and two premises, and three premises, and four premises. And of course, the premises are separated by the commas. All these premises entail this conclusion. This symbol is called the entailment symbol, or the turnstile. It basically means therefore. Entails is kind of a fancy word for their for therefore. Okay, now obviously I've already set up the argument over here in the standard way. We take all the premises, we number them, we stack them on top of each other, and then we have another column over here. What's this column called? It's the justification column, and every premise is justified merely because it's an assumption. Quick reminder about what it is that we're doing with a proof. We are, of course, proving that the argument is valid. And you know what this means because you know the definition of validity. The definition of validity says an argument is valid if and only if, and now comes your part, And hopefully, you just said the following. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Notice the all these ifs are important. The if and only if introduces the definition. The if over here is part of the definition itself. Our definition is a conditional, an if-then sentence. So you know how silly I want to be about knowing this definition. So I, I encourage you to learn it if you haven't already. Um, let me call let me let me bring some excitement to the definition. Here we go. Oh yes. It, it, isn't that exciting? Really high, high level special effects, no? Okay. Whoops. I guess I've had my fun. Um, all right, go away definition. We don't need you anymore. Back to the proof. If I have a difficult proof like this, well, not difficult proof, but if I have one with some complexity, I think it's oftentimes a good idea to go through and highlight or identify the main connective on each line. And so let me do that. On the first line, it's obviously the second arrow. We know that the main connective is the connective that is completely outside parentheses. And when you're doing a proof, you should always have parentheses such that there's only one thing that's outside them. Second line, it's the second arrow. Third line, obviously the first arrow. And line four, it's the final arrow. Now, the value of knowing the main connective is it typically tells you what rule to use. Well, right now we've only got one rule, but every time that the arrow is the main connective, all semester long, you'll want to be thinking about the rule arrow out. But moreover, if you know the main connective, then you, have, then you know how to think about the line in terms of P and Q. Everything that's in front of the arrow is P. Everything after it is Q. So when I look at this line, I know that B arrow E, that counts as P. I know that all the rest of this stuff counts as Q. But if you know what counts as P and what counts as Q, well, then it should be easy to apply our arrow out rule. All you have to do is think about this story or script that I'm encouraging you to use when you think about the lines. So, 
If I know that B arrow E is P and F arrow F arrow E is Q, well, I just replace P and Q in this line right here, and I read this to myself. And when I do, I find that it says, if I can find B arrow E on another line by itself, then I can write F arrow F arrow E. So if I can find B arrow E on another line by itself, obviously I have to go take a look. Do I find B arrow E on another line by itself? And I hope the obvious answer is no, you don't. If you see B arrow E right here, you're kind of looking too hard because this B arrow E is not by itself. If I cannot find the P part that I'm looking for, well, then I lose interest in this line and I merely go on to the next. Notice when you really get comfortable with what you're doing, there, you don't need to waste a lot of time thinking about any particular line. You know exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for the P part. If you find it, great, you can work. If you don't, well, then it's time to go to the next line and think about it, which is exactly what I'll do. So now I'm going to look at line number two. The middle arrow is the main connective, so that means E arrow F is P and B arrow E is Q. And when I read this, I say to myself, if I can find E arrow F on another line by itself, then I can write B arrow E. Do I find E arrow F on another line by itself? Well, and the answer is no. E arrow F on 3, not by itself. And obviously, E arrow F shows up again on 4, but it's not by itself. Okay, so I cannot work on line 2. Thus, now I'm going to go to line 3. And this time, the first arrow is the main connective, and B by itself constitutes P, E arrow F is Q. So what do I say? Why don't you say it yourself? So I hope that you just said to yourself, if I can find B on another line by itself, then I can write E arrow F. Do we find B on another line by itself? And the answer is, no, we don't. There's a B here, but this is not on a line by itself. Okay, so we couldn't work on three. It's time to go to four. Now, sometimes people start getting nervous at this point, but really you shouldn't. Let's talk about four. The third arrow is the main connective. That means everything in front is P, and then B by itself is Q. And what do we say? If I can find B arrow E arrow F on another line by itself, then I can write B. Do I find B arrow E arrow F on another line by itself? And this time the answer is finally yes, I do. B arrow E arrow F. Well, that's exactly what's on line three. Sometimes people are thrown by the parentheses just slightly. They might say, well, why aren't there more parentheses around B arrow E arrow F? Well, notice if I did, if I added those other parentheses there, that wouldn't actually change the meaning of anything. The reason that they weren't there is because they're around the entire line. Anytime parentheses encompass the entire line, that's when we drop them off. All right, so they weren't needed. But it should be really clear that line four is an instance of P arrow Q. P arrow Q. Line three is the P part, the antecedent, repeated by itself. And so to tell the story one more time, I look at 4 and I say to myself, if I find B arrow E arrow F on a line by itself, then I can write B. I found B arrow E arrow F. I'm writing B. I hope this is getting totally boring at this point. Can you tell me what the justification is? It is, of course, the two lines that we just made use of. Now, you could make a really good argument that when you write these line numbers, you should put 4 first and write 4, 3, arrow out, because after all, line 4 was our conditional, P arrow Q. If you wanted to write 4 first, uh, that's not a bad habit to be in, but as you'll see in the packet and for throughout the semester, I actually always list them as 3, 4 in numerical order. 
So the order of these numbers right here is completely irrelevant. Okay, I finally made some progress. I got the B. But there's a lot more to be done. Um, I could check off line 4 because I actually worked on it. And now if I'm just working my way down, I say, well, B is uninteresting because whenever you have just a single letter on a line by itself, that's not even worth it to stop and think about it. And so it's time for me to go all the way back up to the top and just think through things one more time. In fact, let me really emphasize, any time that you're feeling stuck in a proof, that's what you need to do, is go back to the top and look at every line that you haven't worked on. Okay, arrow was the main connective. I say to myself, if I can find B arrow E in another line by itself, I can write F arrow F arrow E. Has B arrow E shown up? No, it hasn't. I still don't have it. Line 2, if I can find E arrow F on another line by itself, then I can write B arrow E. E arrow F still hasn't shown up by itself. Can't work on 2. Line 3, and notice here's where I kind of wish I hadn't put in those parentheses because I don't want this to look at all confusing. So let me get rid of them. There we go. I look at line 3. It says if I can find B on another line by itself, then I can write E arrow F. Oh, well B showed up. So here on line 6, I will write, come on pencil, you can work. Here on line 6, I will write E arrow F. And what will the justification for that be? Well, it's line 3 plus line 5. And so I'm going to put 3, 5. Notice here it makes good sense to put 3 first because that was the conditional that I worked with. And it'll be the name of the rule, arrow out. Notice also that I've now used line 3 two times. And I think this is a really important thing to notice. When I was thinking about line 4, I recognized that 3 was the P part itself. That whole line 3 constitutes P when I'm thinking about 4. But what I just did was to look at 3 itself and say, oh, everything in front of its arrow is P and everything after is Q. So the basic idea is that lines can play multiple roles. That's why line 3 got used twice, because it had two different roles to play. Okay, well I'm still working my way down. Um, B is too short to be interesting. I might quickly glance at 6 and say, hey, if I had E, then I could write F but I don't have an E all by itself any place. What are we doing? Back up to the top. Okay, line one, we say it again. If I can find B arrow E on a line by itself, then I can write F arrow F arrow E. Do I find B arrow E on a line by itself? No, don't have it. Line two, if I can find E arrow F on a line by itself, then I can write B arrow E. Ah, E arrow F, it's right there. So on line seven, I'm going to write what? B arrow E. Of course I'm dropping the parentheses because if I put parentheses around this then they would encompass the entire line and they wouldn't be useful. What's the justification for 7? Well it started with 2 so we're going to check off 2 but we also used 6. So it's 2 and 6 arrow out. At this point, there's actually two possibilities in front of us. Probably the most reasonable and the most common thing to do would be to go back up to the top and say, if I can find B arrow E on another line by itself, then I can write F arrow F arrow E. Oh look, there's B arrow E, so what do I get to write on line 8? I get to write F arrow F arrow E. F arrow F arrow E. Quick question about parentheses here. Do I need any parentheses on line 8? Well, notice I definitely want to put in the parentheses around F arrow E because I want, it to sh I want to show that this arrow is the main connective for what I've just written. So I'm going to drop the outer parentheses because if I left them here they would encompass everything, but it's really important that I include the parentheses around F arrow E. What's the justification for this? It's obviously line 1 and 7, and the name of the rule, arrow out. What line would I be checking off? Line 1, of course. 
Now, as I said, there were actually two things I could do, and it's important to note that it is often possible to do a proof in, and have the lines show up in a different order, because what I just did was 1 and 7. But the alternative thing that you can do is the involves lines 5 and 7. If you look at 5 and 7, you should see that there's an important relationship here. And I also want to point out that this is actually the most common place for people to get stuck when they're doing this proof. You know, they've done what is sort of the difficult things up above, and now suddenly there's a really simple maneuver, and for some reason it just doesn't catch their attention. But let's say that you had gotten to where we are at, on line 8, and you didn't see the next thing to do, if you had checked off 1 through 4, you would then look at the rest of these lines. And you would say, well, 5 is too short to be interesting. Line 6, well, if I had an E in another line by itself, I can write an F. But I don't have an E. Line 7, if I have B on another line by itself, then I can write E. Ah, look, and there's a B in another line by itself, so I should write E. And that, of course, would be 5 and 7, arrow out. Now, again, that's where people get stuck. But the other point I wanted to make is that these two lines, 8 and 9, are entirely reversible. You could have worked on 1 and 7 first, as we did. You could have also worked on 5 and 7 first. And so 8 and 9, are it, it, it matters not which order you put them in. Well, what's going to show up on 10? Well, we just worked on 7. It looks like what's left is 6 and then also 8. Can I work on 6 yet? Well, it says, if, you can find, if I can find E in another line by itself, then I can write F. Oh yeah, there's an E right there. So what do I get to write? F. In fact, it's all pretty boring from here on, right? 6, 9, arrow out. I, I know, it, it, it's been boring from the beginning, right? I, I, I hope you're having that experience. That's good news. At this point, there's really only one more line for me to work on, and that's number 8. And it says that if, you can, if I can find F, then I can write F arrow E. I found F. I can write F arrow E. And of course, F arrow E is what I'm after, so that's my just my conclusion, and my justification will be 8, comma, 10, and the name of the rule, arrow out. And that's it. Success! Should we have some more, uh, there we go, some more excitement? All right, well, thanks for watching. I hope this first rule is making sense. One of the most important things I can say is that what you really want to do is relax and think very methodically. Doing proofs is not about thinking hard. It's about thinking comfortably. If you can find that part of yourself that can actually enjoy doing this stuff, you'll find that uh, it's quite simple and you'll do very well.